Hello, we're back with our second video for this week. And this one is about the market revolution. There's going to be a change in the way people live economically during this time. Now, when we first start in this time period, we're in something called the, um, the moral economy. And think of it like pre-capitalism. You don't really live to make money. You're basically just living to live. Uh, the food you're growing is for your own use. You're not really selling much of it. Uh, you're trading goods and services with your neighbors. And the, you might have a personal credit system, meaning you go to the store, you borrow some stuff, and you pay it back later. And very often, if you couldn't pay your bills, the store owner would forgive some, if not all, the money you owed. If you did have a surplus of stuff, you would sell that, and that would pay your taxes for the year. Uh, in this moral economy, men and women are both equally important. Uh, women are going to keep up with the internal economy of the house. That's the cooking, cleaning, gardening, poultry, uh, milking cows, making the textiles and the clothes. While the men are typically uh, tending to the fields, taking care of the livestock, building the buildings and doing the larger things. Both the duties of the man and the duties of the woman are necessary to create the household economy during this pre-capitalist society. And we have a really good idea of what pre-capitalist America was like because of the, the um, diary of somebody named Martha Ballard. Martha Ballard lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and she was from a place... Uh, called, um, oh, what was it? It's in, it's in um, Maine. Uh, Hallowell, Maine is what it's called. And she lived there with her husband, Ephraim, and she was a midwife, meaning she was present and helped uh, birth children. And she's responsible for bringing over a thousand children into this world during her time as a midwife. Uh, if that's not cool enough, she also kept a very extensive diary. Uh, her diary lasted over 25 years and over 10,000 entries. So we know, we know all about this pre-capitalist society. We know about her baking and her brewing. We know about her pickling and preserving. Uh, we know that she made soap and candles and she spun cloth and wove cloth. But we also know that she was a, a healer. She was like the she was almost like a doctor in Hollowell um, she was very trusted and she was always in need and um, uh, we get to see how she contributed to the society and how the economy worked around her so Martha Ballard uh, her book is extremely interesting um, unfortunately we don't have it at West Georgia Tech's library but we could probably get it for you if you wanted to read it uh, however we're gonna switch from a moral economy to a market economy when Adam Smith writes The Wealth of Nations, uh, he is going to argue that you can have individual wealth and you can have uh, capitalism. And it turns out people want to earn money. Uh, so people start to grow food specifically to sell instead of just eat. Uh, money from those sales are going to be used to grow more food and buy more stuff. And before you know it, people are in it just to you know, make a bunch of money. Now, this is going to require a change in the way we do labor. It's not simply going to be, uh, you know, milk cows and create thread in your own house. There's going to be this idea known as the specialization of labor. Now, early industrialization is going to start in England. Let me move this little circle over. Um, not really anything that you need to know specifically for a test or anything like that, but I think it's good to know where the idea of industrialization comes from. It starts in Britain. Uh, Britain had access to coal. Britain had access to overseas colonies. Britain had tons of money. Britain had the population. And probably most importantly, Britain had stability. There hadn't been an invasion of Britain for many, many years by this point, so people felt confident investing. Eventually, this idea of industrialization is going to make it to America, but it's going to come to America through the rest of Europe. So from Britain, the idea of industrialization goes to Belgium, and then France, and then Germany, and then Russia. 
the United States is going to have its first taste of industrialization in the late 1790s. Uh, 1793, this guy named Samuel Slater is going to build some very well-financed mills in Massachusetts. And um, the story of how the the industrialization came to America is interesting. Samuel Slater basically memorized blueprints and then brought those memories to America and then reproduced the blueprints to create the first mill. Uh, the idea of a, of a mill was a state secret in Britain. It, those plans couldn't be exported, so Samuel Slater had to improvise, and he, um, he memorized them. Well, by 1825, a very, very big mill called the uh, Boston Manufacturing Company is going to be built outside of Boston uh, in the city uh, of Lowell, Massachusetts. And that's because Lowell, Massachusetts and this Boston Manufacturing Company, it was built by a guy named Francis Cabot Lowell. Uh, it's a well-capitalized firm, it's a large factory, and this is going to be the first mill to combine all the elements of manufacturing, the spinning, the weaving, the cutting. Uh, before this, uh, there was something called the putting out system or the cottage system. So before you have these mills, what you would do is you would maybe own a bunch of sheep and you would sell the wool to somebody who would then turn it into thread and then you would buy back that thread. And then you would sell that thread to somebody else who would turn it into cloth and then you would buy back the cloth and you would put the work out to others and the, that's what the putting out system was. You would literally take something and put it out for others to work on. Another word for that is the cottage system. Um, so if you hear cottage system and putting out system, that's where you're having others do the work and you're not doing it all yourself. But this Lowell, Massachusetts, Boston Manufacturing Company uh, factory is the first time they're not putting the work out anymore. It's all coming to them. Uh, from this one mill, by the World War One, you know, basically a 100-year period or so, America goes from being not industrialized at all to having the world's largest industrial economy. Once industrialization gets to America, it spreads very quickly. Now, what causes it to change? Um, there's some developments that happen. Uh, the first one is involving that putting out system. Uh, instead of sending out the work to local women and then buying it back, some of these mill owners say, why don't we just have the women come to us? Instead of putting it under their roof where we can't monitor the quality or the speed and we can't really do much, why don't we have the workers come to us and then we can make sure they're working and we can see how much they're doing and we can really pay attention to them. Um, those mills just get bigger and suddenly, well not suddenly, but over a period of a couple of years they figure out that every piece of clothing and textile manufacturing can be done in the factory. So you're not just turning it into thread anymore, you're turning it into cloth, you're turning it into fabrics, you're turning it into clothes, you're having people design it. And so there's no more putting the work out to anybody else. If you want a job, you have to come to the factory. Uh, by 1790, uh, water-powered machines like the spinning jenny start to show up and by 1840 steam power is there so the mill work just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and faster and faster and faster uh, the Lowell Massachusetts Waltham system as it becomes known as that's the Boston manufacturing company uh, that's the first water-powered loom in America that's the first factory where all the parts of production are put under one roof and the Boston Manufacturing Company has women come to the factory and live there and they have to provide basically a factory town. So Francis Cabot Lowell is going to have dormitories and churches and everything else built for the workers. Uh, most of the workers only live there for a couple of years, um, basically up until the point they get married and when they get married they quit working because it wasn't seen as respectable for a married woman to work. Uh, the conditions aren't very good. You should be reading a, a document about the female workers of Lowell 
and you'll see that they worked from a very young age. It was stuffy, it was hot, it was dangerous, and the mill owners, they were only worried about one thing, and that was making money. There are new inventions. 1733, you got the flying shuttle. That was basically the thing that you pushed on the loom. It got bigger, which meant more fabric could be done. 1764, the spinning jenny is invented, which lets you create, instead of just one spool of thread, you can do eight. Uh, the water frame is going to let you use water instead of pedal power to spin the thread. And by 1787, you have a power loom that is completely automated. Um, the woman just has to sit there and, and move the shuttle back and forth and make sure that the thread doesn't tear. Some other changes involve technology. Um, Eli Whitney is best known for inventing the cotton gin, but the first thing he did was invent the idea of interchangeable parts. He decides, you know, maybe what we should do is have equipment that can build and create exact replicas. That way if your machine breaks, you don't have to buy a whole new machine. All you have to do is buy that little part. Uh, to put this in modern terms, if the idea of interchangeable parts didn't exist, if your headlight went bad on your car, you'd have to throw away the whole car instead of buying the, the $10 headlight. Eli Whitney is the one who comes up with the idea of interchangeable parts. Uh, there are transportation improvements. Uh, roads are going to be built and improved, which means you can transport materials back and forth. But even more than that, canals are built. Uh, there's this huge period of canal building in the early 1800s and water is still today in 2023 the most cost effective way to transport goods um, if you ever go to savannah charleston mobile uh, there are dozens of container ships that come through the port every day well it wasn't any different in the 1800s most things were shipped by boat in fact everything was well when the erie canal is built what the erie canal does is it it connects um, I think it's Syracuse or Albany, New York, one of the two, with the Great Lakes. So you can transport goods from London or Paris all the way to New York, sail up the Hudson River until you get to the Erie Canal, and then take the Erie Canal to um, you know Great Lakes. And then the Great Lakes will let you go to Detroit and Milwaukee and Chicago very, very inexpensively. If it wasn't for the Erie Canal, Milwaukee and Chicago would not be the super important cities they are today. Now you might say, wait, Milwaukee's important? Believe it or not, Milwaukee has over a million people. It's bigger than Atlanta. Chicago is the third largest city in the country with, uh, I think, nine million people. So the Erie Canal is going to open up this, these floodgates, no pun intended, of, of shipping and that's going to make it cheaper for technology to allow the factories to be built and it's going to make it easier for people to capitalize on the factories and before you know it this is an industrial country uh, closely related is the idea of railroads uh, your first railroads are going to be built in the 1830s by the 1840s they've spread to america and the amount of railroads being built just goes up faster and faster and faster uh, by 1850, there's about 9,000 miles of railroad track laid. Um, by 1860, there's over 30,000 miles of railroad track laid. Now, even though most lines didn't connect with each other, it was still useful to transport goods, and it provided a year-round all-weather system of transportation that didn't exist before. Um, Communication is going to get easier. Samuel Morse in the 1840s is going to invent something called the telegraph. And the telegraph was really the internet of the day. It, it allowed for journalism to happen. It allowed for nearly real-time communications. You could get a message from London to New York or vice versa in about six minutes instead of six weeks. So it was really important. The idea of the telegraph is also going to be important for a businessman because you could live in the middle of Missouri and you could place an order and get something delivered to you from anywhere in the world. 
So it gives rise to business, it gets, gives rise to consumerism, all these other things. Now there's another invention that goes along with the telegraph, and that is Morse code. Samuel Morse invents Morse code, and Morse code is used to communicate on the telegraph. As these factories and as these, these mills get bigger and bigger and bigger, most of them are going to be located either in or near large cities. So cities begin to expand. Uh, New York City is going to become the first city with over a million people by the uh, mid to late 1800s. Uh, New York City will become the primary entry point of goods into America. It's also going to become the primary banking center of America. But there are lots of other cities that grow during this time. Savannah was one of the most important cities in the country at the time, and in many ways it still is. Um, if you go to Chicago, or if you go to Boston, or if you go to Philadelphia, anything like that, there's going to be major banking centers, there's going to be stock markets there, and, the, and this country is going to start becoming an urban country, and today, something like 60 to 70 percent of all Americans live within an urban area. Migration is going to come into this city. It's both internal migration and external migration. Uh, you have people moving from the countryside into the city so they can work. Uh, you also have people from Ireland and Germany moving into the country because they need places to work. Ireland's not doing so well in the 1840s because of the failure of the potato crop. Germans aren't doing so well in the 1850s because they try to have a couple of revolts and those revolts are put down. So the Irish and German especially, but they're not the only ones, the Irish and German are, are looking for places to live and they come to America. The federal government's going to get involved in business for the first time too. Uh, state, state governments are going to invest in transportation. State governments are going to invest in banking. Uh, the federal government is going to start um, you know, playing with tax money and allowing corporations to be invented. And uh, these corporations are going to be formed, and they very often become, you know, private entities. So, 1830s, a huge shift. Now, I, was, I should say, by the end of the 1830s, going into the 1840s, there's a huge shift in the way Americans are going to live. Turn of the century, it's mostly self-sufficient, self-subsistence, let's just get through the day. And by the 1840s, 1850s, people are working for the man. They are making money. They're worried about capitalism. It's a huge shift. Now, for next week, I'm going to, I think, make a separate video about this and post it um, on Tuesday. Or maybe Wednesday. We'll figure it out. But next week, we're coming up to the final exam very soon. The final exam, it is going to be a proctored exam, meaning you have to either take it in person in front of somebody or using the respondent's lockdown browser. But I don't want to add it to this because this is almost 20 minutes long already on top of the other 30 minute long video. So uh, just keep an eye out for that. I'll send you an email as well. And uh, tell me you watch this. And if you tell me you watch this, I'll give you a couple extra points on the, final, or on the midterm exam as a thank you. All right, we'll see you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.